Hey guys, it's Kyla at the MJC, and I am here today to show you how to fill out the Request for Pretrial form, uh, which is one of the forms in a contested or separate Part 2. But before we get into it, I do want to just remind everyone that nothing in this video is intended to be legal advice. It's a video, so it means I'm not able to analyze your situation and to determine whether uh, this is the right form for you to be filling out, whether what you're proposing is what's in your best interest given your situation, or anything like that. So if you do have those sorts of questions, uh, you should definitely get some legal advice. You can get brief legal advice for free here in Milwaukee County through the Marquette Volunteer Legal Clinics. If you're not located in Milwaukee County, then you can contact your clerk of court to find out what resources are available in your area. Uh, so looking at this form, you will note right off the bat, the request for pretrial is a Milwaukee County specific form. So that's why we don't fill in the county, it assumes Milwaukee County. So if you are filing in a county other than Milwaukee, you most likely do not need this form. Uh, if you're filing in Milwaukee, you do need this form. So we're going to start by filling out the caption. You guys who have watched some of my other videos may remember that a caption always needs to be the way the order of the names in the caption needs to be the way they were originally. So um, on this first line, you're going to put whoever's name went first. So if you filed separately from your spouse, uh, you filed the first part, the part one, the summons and petition separately. Uh, you'll put your name here because you are the petitioner in that. If you were, uh, your spouse filed part one and served the documents on you or had the documents um, given to you and you signed an admission of service, then you would put your name here because you would be the respondent. If you and your spouse started as joint petitioners and your name was listed first, you'll go on this line. If you and your spouse started as joint petitioners and your name was listed second, your name will go on this second line, even if you're the one that's now wanting to go forward. So remember, the name should always be in the order they were originally. Uh, so those of you who remember back to uh, our other video, Jane was our petitioner. Uh, so we'll put her name first and John was our respondent. So we'll just put uh, their names there. Then up here, you're going to put your case number. The case number is usually stamped on either your summons or petition in purple. And it's going to list a year, 2020, uh, right now. Uh, but if you're watching this in the future, it could be 2021 or 2022 or who knows. Um, but we usually just shorten it. You know how sometimes when you write the date, you might put, you know, 11, 15, slash 20 instead of writing 2020 all the way out. We do that with case numbers. We just put 20 instead of 2020. Uh, if you're doing this in 2021, your case number, you would put 21, right? So it's, um, we just use that year portion of it. FA, and then it should have six numbers that follow. And again, you'll wanna make sure they're the ones that are uh, listed on your uh, stamped petition. So then down here, on your document, you probably have a judge's name, so it'll be the honorable someone, judge someone, and it'll say family A, B, C, D, or E. You're going to select whichever one of these bubbles corresponds with the fa you know, family letter that is stamped on your paperwork. So we'll assume for our purposes that uh, John and Jane uh, are with family B. All right, so then down here, you are going to put in your name. Uh, so we'll say that Jane is the one filing this one. But again, if your name was here, you can list it there, no problem. And then you're gonna check whether you are on the petitioner line, this first line, or the respondent line, this second line. Uh, so Jane's name is up here, so she'll check that box. Obviously, if John had written his name here because he were doing this, we would check respondent. Here you're going to put the date that the document was filed with the court. So the date that your original summons and petition, if you started separately or if you started jointly, the date your joint petition was filed with the court. You can find that listed on your petition. It's usually stamped in red. It might be on the summons, but it's usually on the petition. And it's stamped in red and it'll say file date on it. 
Um, you can also find it by going to CCAP, C-C-A-P. You can Google that and uh, pull up their case search feature where you can search by case number or by your name to find that uh, as well. In number three here, you're going to indicate how service was accomplished. So if you originally started as joint petitioners, joint petitioner A, joint petitioner B, and you, si you both signed a joint petition, you'll check this box here, and then you'll calculate 120 days from the filing date. Uh, you can do that up here uh, through, this is just a date calculator, it's timeanddate.com, uh, but you can also Google, I believe you can just Google um, that. But so you're going to Google, if you're joint petitioners, you're going to put the date that you filed, and then you're gonna add that 120 days. And then this thing will calculate for me, November 12th of 2020, we'll go back to our document and we'll write that in. Um, so that's for those of you who started jointly but are now going forward separately. For those of you who started separately and had to have your spouse served, you will not fill out that one. You will pick either, 99% um, of you are gonna be up here in this first one. The summons and petition were served on the respondent and you're gonna write the date. So if you have an affidavit of service from the sheriff or uh, an admission of service from the other party, a third party affidavit signed by a friend or family member, Whatever your proof of service document, you're going to list the date that the other person was served. If you served by publication, this is not the right set of forms. So if you served by publication, you'll want to go ahead and go to the default videos. Uh, but here, again, assuming you had the other person served, you'll indicate the date they were served. So we'll say Jane uh, got John served pretty quickly. It was the 20th. And you want to make sure, we want to be sure that this day you've listed here is within 90 days of this one. So based on the date I listed, 720, which is the date John was served, um, it's pretty clear that it's within 90 days. But if you're not sure, so like if it were, you know, 1029, I'd be a lot less sure that that was within 90 days. So you can go here, you can take that um, date of filing, and you can add 90 days to make sure October 13th. So you can see in this situation, it's outside of that 90 day period. If you find that you're outside of that 90 day period, then that's a good point to go ahead and get some legal advice. The only time where that won't matter is if you, um, before the 90 days, you ask the court for additional time to serve. If you did that, you'll go under the second box here you will write the new deadline that the court gave you, and then here you'll write the date that the respondent was served. And then you'll calculate 120 days and put that here. Um, but So back up here, we'll go back to our original one. So this is the date of service. It is within 90 days, so we're good there. And then you have to calculate 120 days from that date. Again, I just Google date calculator and get a website that will do it for me. Or again, you can ask Google to calculate it for you. Um, or you can get a calendar and count it out, but you wanna make sure that you are getting the exact date. So we'll go here, we're gonna put in 720 of 2020, and we wanna calculate 120 days. And that gives us uh, November 17th. So I'm going to write that date here. Uh, some people worry, they see that date and they say, oh my goodness, that date's already passed, is that a problem? You don't need to worry if that date, this date here has already passed. Um, it, that's fine, it's not a problem. Or similarly, if that date is still upcoming, that's not a problem, it's just calculating the cooling off period for the court. So that's basically the earliest you could possibly get uh, divorced under our cooling off period rules. All right, so we've gone through service. The next thing you'll do is you'll go to this line. If the case involves minor children, you'll fill this out, but since, uh, yes, yeah, so if this involves minor children, You'll indicate it involves minor children, and you'll indicate whether the petitioner, the respondent, or again, joint petitioner B, uh, or both people have met that parent education requirement. So taken that uh, approved parent education class and gotten a parent ed certificate. Um, so if Jane had minor children, 
She would check here. She would say, I'm the petitioner. I have taken it. If she knows for sure that John has, she could say both parties have. But if she's not sure about John, could check here. Again, if John were filling this out, he would check that he had done it, unless he was certain Jane had. If John and Jane don't have minor children, they would check this second box saying that they don't have minor children, so they weren't required to take a parent education class. Uh, and last but not least, if you filed a request with the court asking them to waive your parent ed requirement and they agreed, they signed a written order saying that you did not need to file, um, did not need to do the parent education requirement, then you can check this box and you will either need to attach a copy of the order that said the parent ed requirement was waived or uh, if you have previously filed that order with the court, you can check here. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and go back. Um, for our purposes, I know some of you watching have minor children and some don't because this is used for both the with and without. We'll say that uh, Jane does have minor children for this one. Uh, and again, going there. But if you're watching this and you are, uh, you don't have minor children, you'll just check that box there. So then next we go to number five and it's asking if there are disputed issues. This is a really a little bit of a tricky question because I get a lot of folks who say, you know, they're filing contested because the, you know, they haven't talked to the other person or the other person doesn't want to participate in the process, but they think that the other person will agree with what they're proposing. They're just saying they're going to keep their stuff and the other person's going to keep their, um, what's theirs. And they don't think the other person would disagree. What I usually tell people, I mean, you can obviously get legal advice on this point, but what I usually tell people just for filling out the form is, if you and your spouse haven't talked through all of the issues, so you haven't talked through, um, you know, maintenance and property division and all of that, then you probably don't know for sure whether or not you guys agree. Um, if you have talked through and come to an agreement about everything, um, then if they're willing to sign and uh, complete the paperwork, you should do uh, it either joint or stipulated. But if you're in a situation where you and your spouse don't communicate, um, then, you know, again, because you haven't been able to talk about whether you agree, we would say that there are disputed issues, um, which just means that you're submitting a proposal instead of um, an actual signed written agreement between the two of you. So for most folks who are going forward contested, even if you think your spouse would agree, we're going to say there are disputed issues for the court to address because um, you're submitting your proposal, and we don't know for certain, because the other person hasn't signed the agreement, we don't know for certain um, that they agree to it. Again, you may know pretty clearly that you think they would, um, but if they, you guys aren't able to get a signed agreement together, we would typically say there are disputed issues. If you have children, um, you would say there are custody and economic issues. Again, that's just saying that your proposal is going to suggest custody and placement along with property division. If you and your spouse do not have minor children, so if you are filing this without minor children, then you will just say economic issues. Don't need to check the box for custody. Uh, but again, up here I said Jane had minor children, so we'll check that there. And then last but not least, you'll indicate whether or not there is public assistance involved. So public assistance is like food share or um, badger care, those sorts of things. Uh, for those of you who have minor children, this box is pretty easy. If you or your spouse receives public assistance, or both of you do, you check this second box. If it's you, you check that box. If it's, or I'm sorry, if it's the petitioner, you check that box. If it's the respondent or joint petitioner B, you check that box. If both of you receive it, you check there. Um, so that's pretty easy. If you don't get any public assistance, you'll check that no public assistance is involved. Where it gets a little complicated is for those of you who don't have minor children. Um, if you don't have public assistance, easy enough, you check the first box. But if you don't have minor children but do get public assistance, you have two options. Um, some folks will tell you to just go ahead and check that no public assistance is involved, because as you can see, the sort of thrust of the question is, does the child support agency need to know that this is happening? Uh, some people, and this is what I usually do, say check whether you receive public assistance, but just use a pen to line out uh, those 
uh, those particular lines so that they know that you didn't actually serve uh, the Child Support Enforcement Agency. All right, well, that is all for this forum. I will see you guys for the next one. Until then, go out and represent yourselves well.